This video made possible by Killer Visual Strategies. Let us tell your story. Visit KillerVisualStrategies.com to learn more. So this is a lot of fun, and it's always fun to spend time with you, Steve. I, uh, and thank you for being here. My pleasure. Absolutely. So, Steve, some folks in the audience, a lot of folks in the audience know that we actually got to work on a fun project last year called Numbers Geek, a podcast. And I got to say, I got to learn a lot from you, and it was really fun hanging out with you. But perhaps no place was it more fun than hanging out on the, the courtside, <laughs> courtside at Staples Center <laughs> recording a podcast. If, no one, if you haven't heard this episode, I encourage you to go back and see it. But, you know, it was really a fascinating experience for me because I learned a lot from you. You know, I covered you for many years during your time at Microsoft, but I got to see the, the, the lows, the, the funny moments, the, the lows, <laughs> and I also got to see the highs along the way, you know? And, and to me, I learned quite a bit from you during the process of putting that project together. I learned about the importance of intensity, hard work, thoughtfulness, passion and loyalty and determination, and also high standards. I can remember moments when we were recording shows and you would stop and say, no, let's get that number right. We got to, is it inflation adjusted or not? And so throughout this conversation with you here today, I'm going to be showing you folks that you have worked with and asking you what you've learned from them along the way. First of all, Steve, can you just catch us up for folks who have not paid, been paying attention to what you've been doing? Give, give us a sense for what, how you've been spending your retirement. <laughs> Retirement's pretty good. Uh, I don't recommend it from all, for all of you this early in life, uh, but for me, what's happened over the last five years since I left Microsoft is I control my time. When you, when you have a regular job, uh, your customers, your employees, um, all of that, I think, really dominates. And what I found since I, I left Microsoft is I get to pick and choose what I do, how much of it I do, and I really enjoy that. Uh, I'd always look forward to a next phase of life. And I'll tell you, uh, you can make it pretty good on this side. Uh, I spend some time on uh, philanthropy with my wife. We focus on kids in the United States who may not have a shot, if you will, at the American dream. Uh, I get to focus some time on USA Facts. I became fascinated uh, with what our government does and who it collects money from and what it spends it on. And that's been both interesting and rewarding to me, although we still have, it's a software product, essentially. We still have a long way to go. I can tell you uh, what our roadmap looks like for that. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on the Clippers, uh, which has been just a barrel of fun. Uh, not only do you get to go to games and, and at least participate in the right way and putting the roster together, but it turns out the business side is actually quite interesting. Uh, we've been working on, a, uh, if you will, augmented reality experience for enjoying sports and specifically basketball. And last but not least, we're trying to build an arena. Uh, that would be, if you will, my house in LA. Uh, we live in Seattle, but it'd be a very big house, uh, so to speak. And it's a pretty interesting project to, to, to do. That's perfect. You just gave the summary paragraph for the, for the session. So we're going to touch on elements of that and some surprises along the way. So Steve, let's start with Connie. You mentioned your wife, Connie Ballmer. What have you learned from her over the years? Woo, Todd. Risky question. A I lot think. of things, Todd. <laughs> Let's start with that as the, the basic answer. Uh, but uh, if you will, uh, I am very up and down as a person. I'm charged up. Oh, I'm depressed. Uh, so I go up and down a little bit. Uh, my wife, Connie, is much more moderate, much more even. Uh, and it turns out that's not really a bad way to be. Uh, it certainly didn't characterize uh, my t tenure at Microsoft, uh, but I have found that a better way to be, now that doesn't mean when we lose a game, it's not, Row! and when we win, you know, win a game, it's, it's uh, the contrary, but finding a little bit more level spot versus the intensity and the highs and lows of, uh, of running a company has been really interesting. So it was Connie, in fact, who set you on the path to start what became USA Facts. She challenged you and said, Steve, we gotta step up. 
we got to do more in philanthropy. And you said, well, wait a second, that, that's the government's role, right? Shouldn't the government be doing that? And you realized in the course of researching that that you just didn't have the data that you needed. And so you started USA Facts. And the idea was to present to the American citizenry as effectively the shareholders in the country the data that they need to have a common understanding of the issues as a starting point to have a civil debate in this country based on the facts. How's that going? Well, <laughs> we, we, we went through what I would call a stealth phase uh, to figure out whether there was really a there there. Uh, we launched our product about two and a half years ago. Our first product was an annual report if you will, in a 10K for government in the United States, www.usafacts.org. Uh, no revenue involved in the model uh, because we really wanted the thing to be, to be pure, if you will, in that sense. And what we've been doing ever since is continuing to enhance the product. Uh, we have a database of, of government numbers. We're adding to it. We need to make that database more searchable. We want to put an API on that database. We are now building up, if you will, our app portfolio to have different presentation of, of those numbers. Uh, but we've been working, working away. Our traffic has been building. We, we talk about the number of quality interactions we have with our, our customers. We're over, uh, if you will, a million uh, unique interactions with, with uh, different customers over the course of a year, closing in on a million five, which, at least for now, as we get our uh, sort of target audience better defined as the kind of person, for example, who might read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, it's a good start, but I'd say we're now in version one and a half, uh, and I'm okay if we don't get things totally right to version three, as some of you may know. But Steve, if the ultimate goal is to, to make it, <laughs> to, <laughs> you slipped that one in there, that's a good Microsoft joke. <laughs> as a reminder, Todd, as I tell people, it's terrible to get things right by version three, but if they make 10 billion a year after that, it's, it's really okay. <laughs> so if though the goal with USA Facts is to ground the national conversation in a common understanding of the facts, it seems like we're not there yet. Is that fair to say? What are your observations and your lessons that you've taken away from the process of trying to refocus the national attention? Okay, so first question you have to ask is what's a fact? In a world of fake news and alternate facts, what is a fact? And we decided that a fact is some recording of what did happen. Numerically, what did happen? Numbers are nonpartisan. You know, we spent as a country X trillion dollars last year. How does anyone debate that? Our third grade reading proficiency is X as a country. How does anybody debate that? You can't make forecasts. These things called adjectives, they're really bad. Adjectives are really bad when it comes to describing numbers. If something is 1% and something else in a different year is 2%, would you say in adjectives and verbs it doubled? Or would you say it's an insignificant change? I don't know, but if you just say year one it was 1% and year two it was 2%, that is a great way to characterize the past. And just like a company in its 10K, you report the past, you don't speculate about your future, that constitutes the facts. Uh, one thing we found is people struggle a little bit with numbers. Uh, they're a little better with graphs. So how do we use graphs to, to bring some of this, this stuff alive? People care a lot about local data. People will ask, uh, what is the crime rate in our city? We don't have that local data yet. We need to build out uh, a product that addresses those facts. Uh, and when it comes to, to the facts, providing context is very important. Without context, you're almost like a politician. You grab one number out of thin air, boom! Did you know the foreign aid budget is $30 billion? Well, compared to you know, six trillion, that's actually not that big as a percentage and you need to provide the context on these things. And oh, by the way, the biggest part of the foreign aid budget is going into places like Iraq, 
where we are nation building, not giving for the poor of that country. So you really have tried to get this message across. Is it being heard? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my most recent thing, I'm pumped up. This product is supposed to be for a lot of people, not just policy wonks. But the coolest thing I did recently is Senators Romney and Schumer convened a bipartisan group of senators. And we ran through, I don't know, about 20 PowerPoints. And they were really upbeat and kind of fascinated by it. And I was, I was juiced by that. Even there's some politicians really want to understand our country by the numbers. That's, that's interesting. It's not what the impression would be watching debates, for example, necessarily. <laughs> no, you know, it, it would it, not. Yeah. So do you have any hope that that'll go further to uh, pervade more of the national conversation? We are going to push further. I think at the end of the day, uh, it would make sense for government to create its own government by the numbers, the way a business needs to. I think we're a long way from that. We should even have a corporate type attestation like CEOs have to do on 10Ks. I read these numbers and to the best of my understanding, they are correct. And just, you know, there's the expression from uh, uh, former Senator Daniel Poitier, Patrick Moynihan, people are entitled to their own opinions, just not their own facts. In fact, it goes even further back to President Madison, and I won't get the quote exactly right, but what he said, in a democracy, if people are not educated or have the ability to educate themselves, the democracy is but a tragedy or a farce. And I think that's where we are right now in our country. So let's look at a couple of the numbers that you look at when you look at the state of the country. And one of the interesting things is you do apply a business person's mindset to these numbers. So I know that in general, the trade deficit, the trade balance is something that you watch closely. What do you see in these numbers? Well, I think there's a, a few interesting things to, to pay attention to. Uh, number one, uh, imports, as we know, exceeds exports. And the degree to which there, there is a difference is more, um, it's a more flat line than most people ex would expect. I think most people would expect that our uh, deficit, trade deficit has grown linearly and consistently, uh, relative, uh, relatively speaking. I think that is a surprise. I'm not saying there doesn't need to be action. We don't recommend action on these things. I think people want to know how tariffs will affect this. And the truth of the matter is government data is old enough that we won't really know how the tariffs have fully impacted these things uh, for, uh, for another, call it, almost year, which, which no company would do. No company would have a radar system that was so much in arrears. In fact, the monthly data can be wrong and gets restated and adjusted. And I think that's, that's an important thing uh, to, to really think through. So this is a uh, Let me make one yes. other, yeah, one other point. Uh, as uh, uh, an investor in a company uh, that builds intellectual property, I am an investor in Microsoft, no surprise to that probably, but as an investor in a company that builds intellectual property, uh, the ability to close this kind of deficit merely by the protection of intellectual property. No software gets stolen, no hardware gets copied, and cloud services uh, can be run uh, freely in the country of China would almost completely close this deficit, in my opinion. But at USA Facts, we don't forecast. Got it. So this is a really interesting one, the next couple of slides. So first of all, spending on K through 12 education per student has increased, I'm sure this is inflation adjusted, 37% since 1980. And then you look at the outcome, because that is something that you do. You look at the inputs and the outputs. Give me your thoughts on this test score chart. Yeah, let me, let me start just with spending. I think if you ask most uh, parents for sure, the notion that spending on education has gone up, inflation adjusted per student, would shock people. Now, some of that is retirement benefits, which you don't see in the classroom, not an insignificant piece. Uh, and also, the fact that student-teacher ratios are actually coming down, those things surprise people. 
given the way they think about class size in their schools. But as a society, we have decided disproportionately, this is one of the fastest growing items uh, in our government spend at the state, local, plus federal level. So, so I think people would be surprised. Then you go to the outcome data, um, and the notion that only one in three eighth graders are proficient in math, that to me is pretty shocking, pretty darn shocking. And if you, you know, sort of disaggregate the numbers by race, which I think is very important, the notion that only 18% of African Americans are proficient in math, only 23% of Hispanic students are proficient in math, and even the, the more generally advantaged group, whites in this country, only 45% proficiency in math. That doesn't speak well, in my opinion, for the future of the country, but these are the numbers you can decide it's great that they're increasing, or you can decide, hey, look, this is a problem. You can decide that the extra expenditure that we spend into education is working, or it's not. Those are your opinions to draw. And this is an interesting one to call out, because I know that this data, these numbers, have informed your own actions in the Balmer Group Philanthropy to use this to uh, help kids realize the American dream. Yeah, one of the things you have to scratch your head and ask is will increases in education spending actually drive improved outcomes? Uh, is that something philanthropically we should advocate for? Uh, will investment in after school programs and summer programs really make a difference? How do you think about those things? We've looked at all this and said, hmm, this may not be the most sensible place to spend the next dollar. We would probably spend the next dollar in preschool and, er, and uh, uh, child care supports. It turns out if a student doesn't come to kindergarten, and there's a measure government provides called kindergarten readiness, that's almost a perfect predictor of what happens later on uh, and is super important. That's great. That's how it's affected us. It could affect others in different ways. We've got two last slides here. The, the first is about overall government spending as it relates to the population. What do you see here? Well, government spending is up 135% since 1980, inflation adjusted, inflation adjusted. Not population adjusted, but we'll tell you population's up 42%, and even the elderly population's up 104%, and a lot of what government spends in the form of Medicare and Social Security goes into the elderly. So government has sure been growing. The biggest part of that has been programs to the disadvantaged. Food stamps, uh, uh, TANF, which was a replacement for uh, uh, welfare, Medicaid. Uh, you can decide, and individuals can decide differently, are we trying to do more to help the disadvantaged or not? And you'll get people who say it should be more about personal responsibility, that's a good uh, expenditure or not. Social Security's been rising faster than the increase in the elderly. Education's 130%, we talked about that. And then Medicare, up 520% versus the elderly up 104%. You could scratch your head and say, are we living longer? The answer, by the way, is no, we are not living longer. We may be forecast to live longer, <coughs> but that's not a USA fact, if you will. Uh, the truth of the matter is we're dying only several months later than we, we used to. And last one I'll highlight is the government employee retirement uh, is the biggest growth area of spending uh, in our budget. And you got to ask what that looks like. One other thing, last thing I'll highlight is interest on our debt uh, has stayed rel versus total government spend has stayed relatively flat going from 6% of government spending to 5%, which I think would be surprising to some people given the rhetoric in the press. Right. And that does not mean that the debt has stayed flat. No, the debt will grow. Uh, the debt has certainly grown. It just hasn't. The interest on it, with interest rates coming down and the debt growing, interest uh, as a percentage is staying relatively flat. And then, this is yeah. unreadable. <laughs> uh, this is completely unreadable. But the, the bigger point is that what you're doing is dividing this into groups of seven to fully understand the impact of 
taxes and income and how they're flowing through different households. Yeah, I mean, how much money does it take to be in the top 0.1% of earners in this country? It takes three million bucks, and that includes capital gains, everything, and that includes, uh, that includes everything. It takes three million bucks, slightly more than the NBA minimum contract, as a way for me to express it, uh, if you will. It's not a small amount of money, but I bet we have entrepreneurs with capital gains who aspire to much bigger numbers than these. Uh, we don't know what the wealth of anybody on this chart is. Government does not collect wealth data at an atomic level for many of the reasons that people will uh, criticize a wealth tax. Nobody knows how to value art and, and private businesses and the like. Uh, it is also interesting to get in the top 20% of earners only takes 100, uh, sorry, not earners. This is household income. So it includes everything out of the household is only $121,000. This takes corporate income tax and attributes it to individuals. I mean, who pays the corporate income tax at Microsoft? Microsoft shareholders. There's no real entity called a corporation. There's only an entity called, if you will, uh, a human being, and governments spend money on behalf. So the bigger picture point here is that you're advocating for looking at the numbers, the debt, and spending by these income groups to see how we should address the debt if we were to address it as a country. Yeah, for anybody in this room, do you set quotas? Are quota setting, is that an important thing in your lives? Well, businesses set quotas. And there are many ways to set the quota, but one of the questions you can ask, not what tax policy to have, but who do you want to pay how much more money? Whether you get it out of income taxes or wealth taxes or corporate income taxes, how much more money you want to raise. You may not care about raising 800 or 665 billion, which is the federal deficit. You may actually say we need more than that uh, in order to fund some of the other programs that you're interested in. You may not care about the deficit. You may say, hey, look, I want less than that. But one of the things uh, I ask myself is, what kind of quota can you set for uh, raising $665 billion? This doesn't take into account any other effects. It's just a quota. It's just a quota. And there are many scenarios that get you there. Uh, one scenario that gets you there is to take the top 0.1% and say the top 0.1% uh, uh, should pay about $636,000 more taxes on an income of $8.6 million in a current tax bill of $3.7. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. You can decide. I'm just saying these numbers work. The next 0.1 to 1 percent, 79,000, and the next 2 through 20, 12,000. Take away a little Social Security and Medicare from this crowd, and you have a balanced budget. Now, what it also says is 14.4 percent of the total burden would be borne by the top 0.1 percent, 17.2 by the next, if you will, 0.99 uh, percent. 0.9, yeah, 0.99 percent, and then the next group would be 68.4 percent by 2 through 20. You could say, hey, I want a different quota. I want people less affluent to, to be affected more. That's up to you. That's up to our elected leaders. But rather than just talk about tax policy and who we should punish and who we should reward, this just says who would need to pay how much to get us back to uh, to a balanced budget or have $665 billion to put in free college and blah, blah, blah. So this is a, an alternative way of looking at the deficit and the long-term debt, and this is something that's not generally happening, I would imagine, in most state houses and in Congress. Uh, in state houses, it's, it's a little more true. People will say, hey, look, we have to balance our budget if we're going to add uh, one in the state of Washington to get a good uh, early education, uh, child care, and um, uh, preschool in this state uh, at quality 
for everybody, middle class and down, would cost about another 1.5 billion a year. And in this state, we say, okay, 1.5 billion, what, how would we raise that? Through what kind of tax and who would get affected? Yes. At the federal level, uh, that's not part of the grand debate we see currently. Yep, good. All right, so and I know that's something you're trying to change. All right, let's switch gears. Uh, one one oh, other yeah. thing. Is there anybody in the room who doesn't aspire to be in the top 0.1%? <laughs> okay, and I'm not, you can decide whether you think you should pay it. My wife would say, let's pay lots of taxes. Uh, that's her, that reflects her value judgment. Uh, that's fine, but I don't think there's anybody who's in business who doesn't aspire, particularly entrepreneurs, who don't aspire to build businesses that generate the most opportunity for revenue, profit, and value. In your business career, you have been involved in many deals. This is perhaps one of the biggest deals you've been involved with in your overall career. Tell us about this one. Okay, uh, for those of you who are not basketball fans, uh, in my opinion, the greatest basketball player in the world right now is a fellow named Kawhi Leonard. Uh, Kawhi Leonard was signed and has joined the Los Angeles Clippers for the upcoming season. And we have some Clips, Clips fans in the house here. And it's, a, it, it's basically a sales process. It's a sales process. He was joined by uh, a competitor and friend of his from college who's probably rated between the sixth and tenth best player in the world. It was a, an amazing coup. But the sa we traded for him. The sales process is interesting. And I think much more disciplined and exhaustive than anything I ever did at Microsoft. We had a person literally trying to understand this, this fella for a year, asking questions in an appropriate legal way by NBA rules. What's the guy like? How would we appeal? A year, a year we worked in that regard. We put together the most amazing presentation to recruit him. We never produced big videos to uh, track top engineers, and yet people would say a top engineer is worth so much. Why not put this kind of energy and effort into the recruiting process? Not for everybody, but for the leaders that you really might want to hire who work someplace else, who are free to move. I mean, literally, this might be a bit extreme, we created a video that cost us almost half a million dollars as part of the recruiting process, and we got the direction on that video for free. That was just the cost of some animations that we had to do. And it worked. <laughs> By the way, we also had to give up five first round draft picks, a, a great, a, to get the second guy, and it was probably important uh, as part of the recruiting process. I learned a lot about hiring that I had no sense of at Microsoft and a lot I would recommend to people. You set your mind on somebody who works someplace else. You don't have to hire them immediately, you, or her immediately. You can really put effort and energy into that process. What about big picture leadership lessons? What have you learned in your time in the NBA as the chairman of the Clippers that you wish you knew when you were Microsoft CEO or that you wished you did better back then? Uh, the balance of long-term strategy and product development and how it fits with short-term accountability. You always have to have a long-term plan. I actually probably got longer presentations about long-term plans from our Clipper staff than I ever did at Microsoft. Maybe too much, but 50 or 60 PowerPoints what if scenarios, how do we go, where do these players, how are they really evaluated, what could we do, six chess moves with our roster, very detailed, thoughtful planning. Uh, more so, in, in fact, than we do in some businesses. Uh, not Microsoft, of course, but in some businesses. There was humor intended in that. Um, <laughs> at least, I can only speak historically, uh, new management may be doing that much better. The flip side is there's much more short-term accountability at the same time in sports. You know, if you miss a quarter, you get on the call and you say things like, okay, we missed, it's this reason, we'll get it back, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Basketball, every 24 seconds you get a grade. You scored or you didn't score. 
the other guy scored or they didn't score. At the end of the game, you won or you lost. There's no blah, 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 we're going to fix it in future. No, we lost the freaking game. That's it. Over. End of story. So the level of accountability is higher in sports, despite the way people think about business, and the ability and need for long-term planning is high and complicated. And really understanding and thinking about that, and maybe in some senses having a chance to learn, business also does many things uh, much better than, than basketball, um, but it was certainly lesson to me about leadership and accountability. On the subject of the NBA and business, I've got to get you to address, to whatever extent you can, the issue that's come up this week about the general manager of the Houston Rockets and the tweet and the issues that uh, were raised there and the NBA's response to uh, his statement about Hong Kong and China. Yeah, the Houston Rockets were the single most popular NBA franchise in China because Yao Ming, the best Chinese player of all time, played for the Houston Rockets. Uh, this week, the general manager of the Houston Rockets tweeted out something uh, expressing support for Hong Kong and the current um, sort of stress between Hong Kong and China. Uh, the Chinese government and citizens and uh, employers reacted very quickly and very strongly in a negative way. People came together and bonded. Uh, NBA preseason games that involve the Houston Rockets will no longer be aired in China, despite the fact that the, goal, uh, that the LA Lakers are playing in China, as well as, by the way, uh, the Brooklyn Nets, who are owned by one of the founders of Alibaba, a uh, Chinese citizen. Uh, the NBA responded uh, in a way that was favorable to players and other people expressing their points of view and acknowledging the concerns in China. The Chinese government founded an insufficient response and upped their level of uh, pressure. Just for reference sake, uh, there are hundreds of millions of dollars that flow into the NBA from China. There's 300 million people in China who actually play basketball and another 300 million in addition who are fans of basketball. It's by far the number one uh, basketball country in the world, and basketball is the most uh, popular sport. The NBA issued a new statement this morning. We'll see how, how that gets responded to. But it is a reminder, more than the specifics around the China issue, that there are government and regulatory and policy issues around which people need to be very sensitive and to try to handle them in a very careful, important way particularly sometimes, as we've seen here in the U.S., there's a balance between the interests of companies and their employees here in, in the U.S. versus China. And more thought, more care, more attention uh, needs to be put in. And sometimes you'll make a trade-off as a company that causes you to either do things in China that make problems in the U.S. Uh, or vice versa. Do you have a sense for where this will end up or any changes that this might create? I don't. <laughs> I don't speak for the league. I do think the league has been very, and this has nothing to do with China, the NBA has really encouraged our players to speak out on social issues. Uh, that, and that has happened consistently. Uh, we've had discipline and, and uh, you know, respect around how our players conduct themselves on the floor. But if somebody wants to be critical of the state of, of uh, policing in the United States or whatever the issue might be, uh, the league does and is very supportive of folks expressing their opinions. Yeah. So what uh, have you learned from Doc Rivers, the head <laughs> coach? Of the yeah, Clippers? Doc Rivers is great. Uh, he's our head coach. And from Doc Rivers, what I would say I've really learned is the importance of people playing their role, as he likes to say. You have to have hard conversations with people about what their role is. Your job is to play defense, and we're not going to run any uh, plays to get you shots. Your job 
is to shoot threes, not put the ball on the floor and break to the basket. Doesn't mean you can't do those some things, but you understand your role. Uh, I think uh, certainly for me, oftentimes it was easier with employees to say the sky's the limit for you rather than describing to somebody what their real role is in the company. And if they can live with that, great. And if they can't live with it, you, you let them part company. So from basketball, I want to transition to technology, but we'll stay in basketball here for a moment. This is Corp Vision. This is a product that you rolled out with a company called Second Spectrum last year at Clippers Games. And we'll get a sort of a sense for it here. It's augmented reality on your broadcast or internet stream. It diagrams plays, there's a coach mode, there's a fan mode where it gets really crazy with lightning on the basket. What have you learned from this project about augmented reality viewing and really the future of technology? All right, so let me first describe exactly what we do. <laughs> right now, this is, not re this is happening live on the court. You're watching the game, it's not like this comes out as a picture afterward. Literally, as things happen in the game, we're throwing this stuff up. Right now, it's a two minute delay from when they happen. A live broadcast is about 20 second delay. Uh, there's technology now that can allow us to get this down to just a few seconds more, maybe another 10 or 20 seconds on top of the normal de delay, actually a little less. Uh, that technology will require deployment in arenas. This is all based on six cameras that live in, ev in every NBA arena. The video, the players get tracked, the video gets watched. There's a machine learning engine that predicts uh, and explains what has happened. It's 42% chance for somebody to make a bucket. Uh, in live, we'll tell you it's an isolation or it's a blitz or whatever the play may be. So there's a, if you will, an artificial intelligence layer that's painting real time, near real time, will be essentially real time on top of the game. We have auto commentator mode where you can get real time commentary on what's going on in the game. You don't have to necessarily listen to the analysts. Now, is this a good thing? I think it's a very good thing. We are, I'll say version one, exactly what enhancements and augmentations people want. Uh, but now we can do all the things we've always talked about in tech. We can augment reality. We can also let people chat around the game, not on a second screen, but right there in a, in a primary screen. Uh, we actually can let there be multiple broadcasts much more easily in multiple languages, Armenian, Korean, some of the languages that are actually quite uh, popularly used in the Los Angeles market. So I'm very excited about it. When I was at Microsoft, I always wanted to do something to take tech and transform sports. And now we get a chance to, to really do it. What is, just a general question, what is the biggest, most popular, most widely used form of augmented reality today? Any guesses? Video games, no. Nope. I think I know the answer, but I don't want to spoil it. The that NFL 10-yard line, guess. said somebody. That's, that's a long-term form of augmented reality. It's not very real time, because football stop, stops so darn often. But augmented reality, in a way that people can understand, has played an important role and will continue to. So we're pretty excited about this. This company was started by two professors of uh, computer science at USC. Um, those guys are, were uh, uh, computer vision experts. We, they have hired six of the last seven basketball captains out of MIT. <laughs> so you need to have real technical people who are really interested in sports, and it works pretty well. Good. Well, I want to continue the, the discussion of technology here with a return to the question of what you've learned from the key people in your life. How about this guy on the left here, Mr. Gates? Yeah, from Bill, I would say I prim primarily learned uh, the value and just how competitive one can really be. Uh, Bill's a very, com uh, the learning I got from Bill is really about competition, understanding competition, working on competition. What does it take to succeed about competition? 
Uh, Bill is both the smartest person I've ever met in my life and actually the most competitive. I'll see how about Kawhi Leonard. I think we may reach a new level of competitiveness. Uh, but I'd say those, that was the top, top thing I learned from Bill. Tell me about your long-term relationship with him and what it's meant to you over the years and where you are today. Yeah, no, I've known Bill since we were sophomores in college. So that would be 45 years ago, uh, roughly. And uh, amazing, amazing relationship. And of course, Satya Nadella, your successor as CEO, is there in the center. It's interesting. You, have, you must be one of the most loyal people I've ever met. What kind of car do you drive? Ford. Yep. Uh, what kind of computer? My dad worked there. <laughs> what kind of computer do you use? Surface. Yes, exactly. So, in fact, I think. And the new Surface lineup is amazing. <laughs> amazing. I'm not in, the, gonna... in the category of com competitiveness, go Microsoft, go! It's the courier. The Surface Duo is basically the courier. Can I go there? <laughs> will, will you go there? No. <laughs> courier was a fantasy. Uh, the Surface Duo is not. Are, have you been testing one yet? Um, I have not been, no. Okay. Because I know, you, yeah, you still get some access to, to technology. Well, I get no access from Microsoft. I am an outsider under SEC regulations, Sorry, yeah. with the exception of the hardware group where I'm under non-disclosure, which does restrict some of my trading, which I don't do. I, I hold my Microsoft stock. So I think I know the answer to this based on what you just said, but how are you feeling about this company? and its prospects, where it stands and where it's headed. Yeah, I think Microsoft's on an extremely good path as a company. I think the, the cloud is working out kind of the way, if you will, we all predicted at Microsoft. It enables growth uh, in a number of different ways. Number one, for Microsoft, uh, there are a bunch of workloads that the company did not participate in, like storage which the company can now participate in, that's market growth. The company has the opportunity essentially to replace labor with technology. The number of people needed in a company to set up things and distribute them and set up servers goes down. And when you replace labor, you can move that to a lower cost, uh, cost uh, expense, but it goes to Microsoft instead of internal labor and the speed with which solutions can be deployed increases, which means you actually get more total development of software. So the cloud thing, I think, has worked out well, uh, and the company's done an amazing job of execution, uh, and I give, uh, give people at the company great, uh, great credit. The other thing which I think is still coming into fruition as a big business uh, is the hardware business. I am delighted with the company is doing with a product line. Uh, despite the rhetoric, there's actually plenty of profit in hardware, at least if you look at the number one hardware company uh, in the world. There's a lot of profit being made on the Mac and the iPhone and others. Uh, I think Microsoft gets a chance to participate through the Surface. And perhaps the most exciting thing in a certain sense is the strength of the Windows business. I read all kinds of rhetoric about Windows not being important to Microsoft. Windows makes billions and billions and billions per year. At least this investor wants to see that profit stream stay along around for a very, very long time. There aren't a lot of new profit streams you can invent that generate the kind of profit that, that Windows does. I have so many follow-up questions, but we're out of time. I, is there, are there any final words, last words here that you'd want to leave the, the audience with? Yeah, I would say only the following. Uh, when I left Microsoft five years ago, uh, my goal was to focus in new areas. I loved what I did in tech, I loved Microsoft, and what I found is in a lot of things I do, as we would all predict, we're sucked right back into technology. What's the technology for re-engineering access to data? What's the technology for transforming the way people um, uh, experience sports, what's the technology that would enable the not-for-profit sector 
and the social service sector more broadly to better serve, uh, better serve people who need it. The social services sector, by the way, is quite backward in its use of technology, which is very sad for me. And last but not least, what technology will transform the experience we can give fans in an arena for how we do security to make that faster, to get people into games, ticketing, point of sale, scoreboards. Uh, there's so much role for technology in the design of new buildings. So despite the fact that I said, okay, uh, I'm in a new world here, I'm not going to do tech investing, blah, 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 blah. In my own way, I'm back doing tech investing and fired up by what uh, technology, and since I'm from Microsoft, they'll say what software can really do to transform the world. And uh, so when you guys were talking up front here about changing the world, it's software, baby, it's software, uh, whether it's embedded in hardware or buildings or whatever, and whether it's delivered from the cloud or from devices, but you guys are all in a hell of a business at a hell of an exciting time, and uh, I share all the enthusiasm in the world for the future of how technology can change the world. Steve Ballmer, thank you very much for kicking us off here this thank morning. Thank you. Thank you.